Okay, good afternoon, everyone, or good morning to those of you joining us on the West Coast. I'm Carl Fippinger, Vice President Fire and Disaster Mitigation for the International Code Council, and I work in our Government Relations Department in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to the ICC's Code Official webinar series, Responding to COVID-19. Today is April the 22nd, and thank you so much for joining us. With that, we'll go ahead and get started here. So this is the third in a series of four webinar series sponsored by the ICC and uh, or hosted by the ICC and sponsored by both the ICC's Building Membership Council and the Fire Service Membership Council. Uh, we've been doing these Wednesdays in April. So again, this is our third one. We did one on April 8th, which was our first and last week on the 15th. Uh, both of those are posted on our ICC website, iccsafe.org. And if you navigate to the uh, Coronavirus Response Center, uh, which is under the Advocacy tab, you'll be able to find those recordings and the materials uh, from those webinars there for you if, uh, if you missed them or would like to share them with colleagues. So uh, again, we're doing them Wednesdays in April. So today is the third in a series of four. Uh, last uh, next week on the 29th, we'll we'll conclude uh, the series. We're doing those at two o'clock in the afternoon Eastern, eleven in the morning Pacific. And uh, invitations to the future webinars will be sent to everyone who registered uh, today, including all ICC members uh, as well. So um, we appreciate your attendance and. Uh, have gotten some really great response to this. So if you joined us before, pardon the uh, the repeat here, but for those of you who are new, we'll kind of cover the ground rules today about today's webinar. This is a moderated panel discussion. Uh, attendees uh, who are uh, joining us today will receive CEU credit from the ICC Government Relations Department through our preferred provider program. And uh, what will happen is either later on today or tomorrow morning, uh, all attendees will receive an email from me with uh, instructions on how to access the ICC preferred provider site and download a copy of a certificate um, that will uh, allow you to be able to submit your CEU. So that'll be proof of your attendance today and that's how you'll get your CEU. So uh, questions are welcome from the audience. We uh, last week made a, I think what was received is a very good change and uh, open it up um, and, and leverage the technology to be able to have uh, questions uh, uh, right from the audience and have audience members who are attending uh, be able to um, uh, join us that way and interact directly with our panel. So send your questions in anytime using the WebEx uh, question and answer window. Um, that usually comes up as a kind of a bottom right or top right uh, feature for you and is also available in your menu there and feel free to, to send those into us. Um, all your questions and your feedback are gonna be used to shape our discussions today and also in our future webinars. So um, please get those in. And if we don't get to them today, uh, we will certainly address what we can next week as well too. Um, today's webinar is being recorded. And as I mentioned at the top here, we will post this one along with the other ones that we've done in the ICC's Coronavirus Response Center. So today's agenda, we'll go through uh, panelist introductions here again, just to refresh everyone um, who's joined us previously. And for those who are new, um, you'll get to meet our panel. We'll conduct a roundtable discussion with questions and answers, and we'll provide a brief code council update uh, near the end of our presentation today, and then conclude with any closing comments and wrap up housekeeping notes uh, at that time. So the members of our panel, Again, joining us from Winston-Salem, Forsyth County, North Carolina, is Dan Dockery, who is the chair of the ICC Building Membership Council. Uh, he is also the chief building official in his jurisdiction. Gary West is the chair of the ICC Fire Service Membership Council. He's also the director of field operations for the National Fire Sprinkler Association uh, and comes to us from Nashville, Tennessee. Ed Lazinski, Vice Chair, Building Membership Council at the International Code Council. Uh, he is Director of Building Inspection and Neighborhood Services for the City of West Allis, Wisconsin. And Randy Metz is the Vice Chair of the Fire Service Membership Council for ICC. He's Battalion Chief and Fire Marshal in Carlsbad Fire Department, the City of Carlsbad, California. So uh, welcome and good morning and good afternoon to all of you. Thanks for joining us again. 
So with that, what I'd like to do is, uh, again, just kind of as a reminder, solicit uh, questions as you have them here, we'll get to them as we can. And uh, at this point, what I'd like to do is maybe shift into a, uh, a quick brief um, uh, opening message from our crew to all of you joining us today and, and the folks out there in code administration world. So I'll uh, steer it over to Dan Dockery for uh, an introduction on that. Good afternoon, Dan. Thanks, Carl. Appreciate you being here and appreciate everybody listening. Appreciate all the panelists and all of the input we've had. Uh, this is, like he said, the third one. We've had hundreds of people on each call, and that's inspiring. And it's also inspiring with the, the thousands and thousands of people who are adjusting to this COVID-19 pandemic and finding ways to do their job and to do it well. Um, we were talking the other day, and, and we all felt reassured that we were absolutely the luckiest people in the world because we get to go out there and find ways to make a difference in our community every single day. And that's something to be said for a, a life and a, a career of service. Um, having that in mind, we wanted to thank you. And so from the Building Membership Council and from the Fire Service Membership Council, just a quick message. And it's a message to all our peers and our partners, and it's from Building and from Fire Safety. We want you to know we're proud of you. We want to know you're, we're proud of what you're doing to serve your communities during this COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, there are so many wonderful, fine examples of innovation, so many examples of creativity that have been put in place that allow us to continue to serve while we ensure our personal and our community safety in the built environment. And we want you to know that these things aren't going unnoticed, not at all. Our new normal, whatever it ends up being, what it has been so far, that normal has shown a light on the emerging trends in our processes, on our procedures. We'll refine those as we go forward, and those things will become the new best practices as we share efforts and communicate with one another and with our partners in the built environment. It's a good thing, and we're making it happen. So as we go through our days, as long and as difficult or as, as enjoyable and inspiring as they are, when we're mixing our work lives and mixing our personal lives, and while we're working so diligently to protect our public, our family, protect ourselves, we want you to continue to ask yourselves these questions. There's six of them, and we're gonna ask ourselves these questions too as we go forward in our work life. Number one, what expectations of normal am I letting go of today? And what, what new normal am I beginning to embrace and to utilize for the betterment of myself? and for the betterment of my community. Number two, who am I connecting with today? Who am I partnering with? Who am I just checking in on? And that leads us to that all important question, who needs me and who do I need? Number three, what am I grateful for right now? And the things that I'm grateful for, what am I giving thanks for today? Number four, how will I be active today? And what effect will those actions have on others who I come in contact with? Number five, how will I get outside? Get outside my home, get outside my office, get outside the rut that, that I'm getting in sometimes. How will I get outside so I can make that positive difference in my community? And number six, what positive association, what partnering opportunity, what growth, what change am I cultivating, am I creating, or am I inviting into my personal and work life today? All of those things are important and they're what allow us to have that wonderful attitude that keeps us serving our communities the way we do. That's it, short and sweet, but thanks so much for all you do. And now just go out there and make a difference in someone's lives. We appreciate you and we know your communities appreciate you. And so just thank you. I'm done guys. <laughs> Thanks, Dan. Well, I think that's only just the beginning. Gary? Uh, how can you follow that? I think that uh, we're all in this together and we're going to come out of it together and and uh, life is changing. Our new normal is going to be different and we're all here together. So thank you, Dan. Thank you, Gary. Ed, any opening comments from you? It looks like Ed might be having a little bit of internet. There we go. Yeah. I know it's muted, sir. But 
and said it all there. You know, and I think we all, like you said, we have uh, we all have one of the best fans in the world. And, and uh, my office in particular. I was and I would just want to jump in really quick and let you know that your your connection is uh, a bit broken here too. So um, I'll give you a quick second to see if you might be able to address that on your end. We're only catching you in fits and spurts here. So Randy, um, opening thoughts from you, and we'll check back with Ed in a moment. Sure. I, Dan said it very eloquently, and I would just also add that you know just as we're doing here with fire service and building membership councils working together. You know, take this opportunity to um, make a greater connection. If you work for the fire department, reach out to building, go see your community development director, um, do a check in there just to make sure that you're doing all you can to um, embrace the relationship side of, of what we're doing right now. Make sure that um, what you're working on is, uh, you know, similar and works well with what they're working on. Share resources, um, information. Uh, you know, it, it, we don't get this opportunity very often to have this type of, of, uh, downtime to really reach across the aisle. Um, so, you know, if you're finding yourself looking for something to do, I would use this time to, uh, build that bond right there and, uh, just see what you can do to help each other. Fantastic. And Ed, I, I see your video kind of going in and out there too. So we'll, we'll come back to you a little bit later on if you want to continue to address that. Shifting gears a little bit into our roundtable discussion here, uh, I think we'll take it back to Dan. And Dan, we've had some good discussions over the last couple of weeks um, about some of these more specific building safety challenges that have um, been presented due to COVID-19. And I know that there's one that um, particularly resonated with you, and that's the issue of quarantine areas in healthcare facilities. So uh, we, we've got a few bullet points on that, and I know the panel has some thoughts on that too. Uh, maybe you can kind of lead us off there with your thoughts and uh, insight on uh, some of those issues. And I'll go ahead and stop sharing my screen so we can get that, that video a little bit larger here for everybody in the audience. So go ahead, Dan, take it away. No, it's and, and you're right, it's very personal for me. My mom's in an Alzheimer's unit. And, um, you know, not only is she inside of, of bricks and sticks and mortars building, she's also locked inside a place in her own head. And to me, that makes it very, very personal. Um, bullet points, I want to start off on the effects of uncoordinated ad hoc blanket policies. Everything is different, and it's really different now in this new normal. And when we're not talking to one another, we make mistakes. And I'll give you a perfect example. We had a fine public servant who is down in our state capital of Raleigh, who works for DHHS, that sent out a blanket letter to, to uh, memory care units and nursing homes and assisted living facilities and said that, no, you do not have to consult with your building or fire personnel when you want to um, put in quarantine areas. Now, they're not just isolating a couple of rooms, they're isolating sections, they're putting up temporary barriers. Uh, that's a dangerous thing. She didn't consider, and she's not a building person, but she is a partner in, in public service, so she should have considered that there are experts out there. She didn't think about egress. She didn't think about paths of travel. She didn't think about uh, putting up temporary walls and placement of sprinkler heads, uh, alarms, strobes, pull stations. She didn't think about materials. She didn't think about flame spread. She didn't think about... Uh, density of smoke development. She didn't think about I-2 occupancies and, and you know, the minimums for those. Um, clear, opaque. We had one facility who wanted to use opaque materials. Well, then you didn't have access to visually see exit signs. So there are so many questions, but there are so many ways to skin this cat to make it available. There are so many materials, and we've got lists of them already posted and published uh, that, that have the right uh, flame spread, smoke development uh, capabilities that allow zipper systems. We've got places like EdgeGuard that make uh, rigid barriers with, with doors already in them, and they come in, and you can wire them with channels at the top where you can move your access and exit lighting and things. There are so many different ways to skin this cat. I encourage you to reach out. 
to your public, to your institutions and say, how can we help you make this easier on you in case you do? And again, I'll go back to my first statement. My mom's got Alzheimer's and she's in a, she's in a fine facility and there are some bad, bad facilities too. And that's a problem, but there's some good ones and we need to make the bad ones better. We make, make the good ones great. That's, that's, that's the mantra here, but talk to them, figure out what you can do. My mom doesn't know what quarantine means anymore. She knows if somebody comes in and smiles, she's happy to see them and she wants to run up to them and engage. Simple as that. We've got to take the first step. And as the professionals in this field, that's that's what we should be doing. And so I'll give it to somebody else now. Others on the subject, Gary. Um, okay, so I'll jump in. I think uh, it's, this has been a challenging time for uh, for everyone and having been a former state fire marshal i know that my fire marshal friends out there have had have had a lot of uh, challenges to deal with during this time too and i think that uh, when things are different when these when the our surroundings are changing like they are then we have to adapt to that and we have to be making good calls and good judgment calls and using the foundations that we have within the codes to to uh, to make sure everyone's safe, uh, I, I think I think it's been a tough time for uh, code officials for sure, and uh, and as you deal with these things coming up in the future, the big thing is is to let's do it, let's do it safely, let's uh, let's protect our public, let's let's realize the purpose behind these codes and and why they exist. Uh, because uh, every code is there for a reason. There's been either someone injured or someone hurt or killed because of because of those codes uh, not being in place before. Uh, in a changing time, though, we we do have to be flexible. We do have to uh, study these and stuff. And and uh, I say to you all, just just keep up the good work and let's keep doing what we're doing. Do it safely. Other reactions around the room, Ed. I see you're back. Uh, your video looks a lot clearer too. How's your audio? Uh, I, I guess you tell me. Is is this a uh, little better now? <laughs> oh, much better. Yeah. All so right, welcome right. back. Yeah. Go, Sorry go about ahead. that. Yeah, I had to jump off for a second there, switch my connection. But um, yeah, you know, I I think Gary and and Dan kind of I, I caught most of Dan's. Um, but uh, yeah, I think you know we we still have to. Uh, we still have jobs to do. We still have to uh, to to make you know, those choices when we're out there. Um, you know, right now we're we're kind of on on um, not really doing a lot of inspections with with uh, our elderly population, hospitals, uh, some of those types of things. We're, we're trying to stay out of those. But um, here in West Dallas, we just had a, a Legionella outbreak in in one of our uh, nursing homes. So it, you still have a job to do. We we still have to get in there. There there's still things that that you need to make it work in this time and and um that kind of goes back to what we were talking about right away with that that opening statement of you know that this is a time for that that innovation and how can we make sure that these places are still safe and, and still be able to do our jobs um while keeping ourselves protected and, and uh, keeping our families protected we don't want to take something back to them so um yeah a lot of great great innovation coming out of uh how to do our jobs a little bit better a little bit safer and and um yeah, it's, it's kind of an exciting time right now. Randy? Yeah, I, I think my my mantra in this period of time is uh, as a code official, when these type of issues are brought to me, whether it's being brought to me by city government or um, a, an agency or a business that's reaching out to me, I'm, I'm looking for an opportunity to find a way to say yes. And that may be um, outside the box thinking and may uh, be trying to um, establish uh, something that's, you know, as safe as reasonably can be expected in light of the current operation there. Um, and I'm going to have to probably approach things a lot different in certain situations. Um, this is not necessarily uh, a situation where we can uh, put our foot down and um, stand behind exactly what every line item in the code says and expect it to be applied um, equally in this point in time. Uh, 
And understanding that that's okay as a code official, you have a lot of difficult decisions to make when it comes to understanding risk behind the decisions that you're making. Um, and that's why we're here. That's why uh, hopefully you have risen to that level or you've been entrusted as a plan reviewer and inspector um, looking at temporary issues on how do we address this, um, what's in the best interests of all parties. Um, and you, you make those decisions accordingly. And um, it, it, if no is the first thing that you jump to, you may need to step back and rethink that. And, um, you know, there may be a time for no, but hopefully that is your, your end result after you've exhausted all of their options um, in reference to the situation. Good discussion on that. And um, going back to the theme of uh, kind of engaging our audience here, just a quick reminder that uh, we are taking your questions in the Q&A box. So you send those along and I can see those as well as the panelists. And uh, we will try to get through as many of those as we can today. So I, I see a couple that have popped up, one from James Key uh, and another one from Lee Kotwitz. And they were, they were similar. So I, I thought it might be good in the context of the discussion we're having right now to maybe look at answering those. So. The question from James. James, I'm going to come to you really quick and see if you're on and uh, unmute your microphone. See if you'd like to introduce yourself and um, you, you know maybe give us a, a quick sense of uh, who you are, uh, where, where you work, and um, go ahead and uh, ask the question. Sure, uh, James Key, City of College Park, uh, Maryland. Uh, pretty much where the home of University of Maryland is. Um, for almost all intents and purposes, it's a deserted town city now because of the, all the college kids, both on and off campus, being gone for some time now. So my question during one of our weekly staff meetings was, um, do we need to start building up and ramping up to doing our interior inspections in some form of legitimate PPE? And I mean, I throw that out as, um, definitely airway protection, whether that's surgical mask, N95, or some sort of uh, particulate respirator, uh, eye protection, gloves, and shoe covers. And I'm sure we could add and subtract some items to that. But um, just going into some of these close quarter apartments that uh, the residents are still home, are we looking at probably having to do that for the foreseeable future? That's a great question. Who who wants to take a run at that one? And thanks, James. I can, I can offer something on that. Um, you know, we've had a lot of dialogue on what's appropriate and uh, for an inspector, and I we've kind of combined that with how fire operations is responding to um, what we have suspected in our emergency medical dispatching as potential COVID patients. And um, we have a different level of PPE that we utilize on people that we suspect may be COVID patients versus those that aren't. And um, I don't think that as inspectors, you need to you know, go into an, an encapsulated Tyvek suit um, uh, unless you're going into um, you know, a building that's been evacuated due to a, a major outbreak, like in one of your um, skilled nursing facilities or whatnot that you know, may have a known concern, um, but, you know, we're sending our inspectors out with um, face coverings and, um, you know, they'll use eye protection if they need to. And if they feel like they need to wear gloves, they are. They're not necessarily putting on, uh, you know, gowns or draperies over their clothing. They're not wearing um, any type of foot covering uh, for that aspect. Um, you know, we're trying to take into consideration what our public health officials have told us um, would be uh, an expectation and take proper precautions there and ensuring that our inspectors feel comfortable and like we've taken their concerns into consideration, but, you know, not treating it as a hazmat type situation um, because for most intents and purposes, that's not the situation. Uh, and if you're dealing with, you know, like a college campus where you don't have actual people there anymore, I think it changes the risk factor on um, what you need to wear 
and how you're going to come into contact with people rather than just entering a building. So that's kind of um, my perspective from the state of California and how most of our inspectors out here are working on annual fire inspections. Any other comments on that one from the panel? Well, I, I think too, um, you know, move, moving forward and, and James, I think that that's kind of your, your point then too, is just, you know, in the future, you know, uh, six months down the road here, are, are we still going to be kind of stuck wearing, wearing masks and, and things like that too? Um, I think that's going to be, you know, up to up to each municipality. I don't think there's really going to be a, a one size fits all type of solution for that. So, um, you know, you, you have a whole bunch of different factors that that come into play. Now, maybe uh, if you are going into some of these vulnerable populations, you know, the nursing homes or, or hospitals, things like that, may, maybe there is a, a higher level that that you want to keep as as, a, as sort of a standard. Um, you know, whenever you're doing hospital inspections, you know, you're you're going to be exposed to people. Maybe it's not. COVID, maybe it's the flu, maybe it's, uh, you know, something else, maybe it's the next uh, virus that, that comes around. Um, so I, I think everybody's got to kind of look at that individually, see what's what you're most comfortable with. Um, and then uh, just just kind of play that by ear. You know, we, we have areas of, of Wisconsin up here that, that haven't had a, a single uh, COVID positive case yet, you know, so there, there's certainly areas that you know, there, there's a lot less risk risk factor than, than something like like downtown New York or or some of these other, uh, uh, like I said, more more vulnerable facilities. So I, I think it's going to be uh, kind of a, a wait and see and, and see what everybody's most comfortable with as we move forward. For sure. And so great follow up on that. And what I wanted to do was um, to just get in a, a quick mention here as well, too, as a, a resource for you, James, and the other folks. I know Lee had this question and, and others in the audience. I'm going to share my screen again here very briefly and um, show you here on the ICC website. If you go to ICCSafe.org, come into our advocacy area and go to the COVID-19 resources section of the website. Um, when you go here to the Coronavirus Response Center, um, we published an article in Building Safety Journal and linked to it right here, Health and Safety Considerations for Building Safety Professionals During COVID-19. So if you hadn't take a, taken a look at that yet, uh, we go through a number of areas in here about classifying exposure risk for your folks, um, what that means, um, you know, take on the whole idea that you mentioned about cross-contamination of workspace considerations, um, and, and more importantly, doing the job hazard analyses for your folks and trying to figure out what level of protection is correct. And we, we point you to a number of places, primarily uh, OSHA and the CDC, to talk a little bit about what their guidelines are, and we try to customize these um, for you, the code officials, to uh, use as a guideline. So again, that sits on the, the Coronavirus uh, Response Center website. It's linked there. And uh, all you have to do is just kind of come back in through the, um, the, the, the front of the ICT uh, website right here under advocacy, and that's where you can find that. So hopefully that's a, a useful resource to you, and we'll, we'll make sure that we, um, we have that post as a, as a resource once we uh, post the... Um, uh, the, the webinar here. So um, shifting gears a little bit, um, Gary, I know this one is one that you were fairly passionate about, uh, given your role in the industry now with National Fire Sprinkler Association. And we, we talked a bit in our lead up calls to today, talking about residential housing and availability of housing stock. And we know that there, it's been at a premium in the country. It's going to continue to be maybe what effects COVID-19 has had on the industry um, and, and the entire um, enterprise from manufacturers all the way down to constructors and everybody in between uh, that kind of works in that world. Um, you know, what, what are some of those tangible effects that maybe we're seeing on um, developers, owners, renters, and, and that kind of thing? So if you want to take that, please do. Thank you, Carl. I think uh, so everyone knows that uh, our housing problems around the country, the shortage of housing and availability of housing stock. So it's been very important to us that uh, construction continue and for construction to continue, it's important for uh, our inspectors and our codes officials to be uh, at work and continuing too. It's been challenging. And I think that uh, our, our message has been the whole time has been about a safe work environment. So if you have a safe and work, work environment, and you can work, then we've supported the, the industry of keeping housing going. 
not just single family dwellings, but um, our apartments or townhouses and things like that. Um, in, in this time, uh, industry has suffered a lot and, and it starts at the suppliers and, and the manufacturers. So uh, keeping, keeping everybody at work is, has been important also. Um, all the way through the, through the whole chain, through the whole cycle of manufacturers, suppliers, contractors, inspectors, developers, uh, through the whole chain. So I, I've seen this in different, at different levels across the country. And, and as uh, I said just earlier, that the situations are different in different areas. And, and what, what happens if we have a, if this comes back or we have a, a relapse, relapse on what's happened and uh, how are we going to deal with that? Those are all things to consider. Um, where, um, where these uh, uh, places are at, where we need the residential homes and stuff, um, hopefully we can keep working in those areas. For sure, and I know lots of folks out there echo those sentiments in terms of keeping the industry moving. Other reactions from around the panel? On that one, okay, we'll shift gears into um, maybe a little bit of a, a foreshadowing here of maybe wh where do we see the codes going uh, and how are they gonna be affected by the COVID-19 experience, do we think? I mean, and you know, it's it's early to say, but I, I think in our discussions, we talked a little bit about the, the there may be, you know, certainly changes that come about, but um, those may also include some threats and challenges that we haven't seen before too. So. Uh, who'd like to take that one and start with it? Gary, is that one for you again too, or do you uh, want to take it? I'll, I'll be happy to jump back in, but um, inspection, testing, and maintenance of systems, all of our systems in our buildings are important. And um, we've got to make sure that our buildings, they're built safe and that they're maintained safe. So. I'm just throwing a, a plug in there for for you all. It's it's generally the it's generally the the building owners that say, hey, we're not in that building, so maybe we don't have to have these systems on. the The reality of that, and we talked about this on the last call. The reality is is that it's putting firefighters in harm's way, and uh, inspection, testing, and maintenance. I can't push that too much. It's and not just about fire sprinklers, but about all all systems and buildings. And I'll add on to that as well. Um, you know, we're coming into a code cycle next year where we'll be looking at fire code and building code changes. And you probably will see people submitting some code change proposals based on their experience during the COVID on how we use buildings in a temporary fashion. Um, you know, trying to, uh, you know, possibly create some new appendices that may allow for building uses um, and take some of the lessons learned that we have experienced right now and uh, create a framework for how you can utilize a building um, in a temporary way, whether that's for, you know, housing of, of homeless people in a temporary facility or, um, you know, creating temporary healthcare facilities in, in buildings that we don't normally utilize so that some of these experiences that we have had um, can be acted on much quicker because some of those answers may have been um, you know, memorialized through some form of codification um, for all to experience rather than uh, having each state be out there on their own and trying to deal with some of what we're experiencing now. I, I could very easily see um, some proposals being floated that address those issues. Well, and I think the the thing to keep in mind here too um, is th these codes aren't just written, uh, you know, by by somebody sitting in a, behind a desk who, who says, "Hey, I think this is a great idea." I mean, these these codes come from the people, and anybody can throw a, a code proposal out there, and then it's it's voted on by the membership. So, you know, everybody on this call, um, 
you know, that, that you need to participate, you need to be involved, um, you know, pay attention to those code change hearings uh, when, when things do start popping up, you know, get involved, do some research, see what, see what people are proposing, see how that's going to affect you and, and make sure that you get out there, you, you vote on CDP access. Um, you know, I, I think right now they're, they're uh, have a call for committees out for, for the BCAC and FCAC and, and uh, some of those committees, um, you know, who are, who are going to write a lot of these different proposals. So, you know, just, just get yourselves involved and, and uh, pay attention to what's, what's kind of going on out there. Um, codes don't just, just pop up and, and get put in there. They, they need a lot of debate, a lot of uh, input, and they, they have to get voted in by the membership. So, so stay involved is, is pretty much my message to, to everybody. And it, the action's on that. Great, it may also be a great opportunity for you to, um, you know, write your first code change proposal. That's not something you've had any experience on, but you think you've got something that um, works well that you created um, and should be codified. Don't wait for one of the, the large groups to do it. You know, anybody can do a code change proposal at any level. And uh, there are people out there that can help you, um, you know, fill out the paperwork for that. But it's a great learning experience and opportunity as well to be able to carry something. And, you know, if it gets voted on by the membership and it ends up in the code, you know, you can look to that and say, you know, this this was my my contribution to this process right here on how I, um, you know, had an impact in making the community safer for everybody. Oh, great, call, of, great conversation, all those, go ahead, Dan. All of those are fantastic points. They are, and it's a big subject. It's a huge topic. Changes to the code that are brought about by what we say are threats or challenges. Um, again, it's an opportunity for innovation. It's an opportunity for creativity. Uh, I, I know we are rising to the challenge because I see it all across the state of North Carolina and I hear it in these panelists that are talking here and I see it in the questions that are coming up on the screen. Um, we're all public servants. One thing to remember is all politics are local. And we've got to be aware that if we're going to talk about potential changes to the code coming out of this, that politics are going to play a big part. We're in a period where the economy is, you know, depressed uh, in some accounts and crushed by other accounts. And it depends on how it has directly affected you. And so I fully expect that when we return to our new normal, whatever it is, the people who lobby for codes are going to come out with some things that they think we should implement. And I think we need to be aware that they will look to remove things that they say are costly to single family residential building, for example. Are there places where residential sprinkler systems are mandated? How much does that add to the base cost of a house and yes it's negligible but it's an easy target energy and sustainability i don't think we'll ever get over the hump of making people or, or allowing people to realize that our energy cost or in new construction are negligible compared to the savings as a community as a state as the united states as a world um but Again, it's dollars right now. And as we're coming out of a, a recession, a depression, a great crunch, whatever you want to call this thing, I think that the codes will be under a, an assault. I don't think it'll be huge, but I think it will be very, very noticeable and very, very critical. And so I think we ought to use that time to put together our arguments, uh, to unify ourselves as a body and to figure out how we make sure that the things we know work and serve our public well are preserved in that body we call the building codes. And it's a big challenge, but I think that we can do it. I think if we get together, Ed mentioned that uh, the codes are made by people. Okay, we're people. And we know our business and we know the codes. We know where we want to be 30 days, 60 days, a year, two years, five years from now. We know how we want to preserve safety for those in the built environment. Let's get up and let's get active and let's get busy and get ahead of this curve that I think is coming for people who want to change codes. And let's make it happen on our end 
so that we can be partners for good code development going forward good code enforcement every single day great points dan and uh to reinforce what ed brought up so um the committees are uh, there is a current call for committees that is out and applications are due uh, June the 1st for those there are a number of them and you know there's so many today that um, we, we wouldn't be able to cover them all but what I'll do is just show you a, a quick place to look again on the ICC website if you go to the uh, councils and committees section you'll see uh, the call for committees here and um, there is a, a fairly substantial document that's put together by our tech services team that's out here that will give you literally all the information that you need on uh, 2021, 2022 code committee uh, applications and the cycles. Um, some of them even extend into 2023, but just to give you a, um, a quick idea on the group A cycle as an example, um, IBC egress provisions committee, uh, IBC fire service or fire, I'm sorry, fire safety provisions, which are really chapter seven, eight, nine, um, of the uh, the IBC, um, the, the International Fire Code, uh, which also includes our WUI code, um, the a number of committees uh, up for uh, volunteer participation. And um, th this document is available. We'll publish it after this webinar. And again, it's available on the, uh, the ICC website under the councils and committees and the, the due date is in the first and I'll I'll hit that again in my my wrap up here too but I think it provides us a really great segue into um, the participation in membership councils and the value that that creates um, both personally and professionally for folks but also for uh, the code council and the strength of its membership so maybe we talk a little bit about that piece that Dan brought up that you know people make the codes happen and talk about maybe how some of you expect to see things flow through your your councils and what kinds of things would transpire and the, the maybe the subcommittees and other mechanisms that we already have available in those groups to kind of deal with these emerging issues, trends, topics. So who wants to take that one on first? I'll start it and then get out of the way real quick. Uh, we teach a little class uh, about um, inspector behavior and how to enhance your service in the public eye. And one of the questions that we ask uh, that I hear inspectors say all the time, well, that's what the code says. And, and I want to remind them that the code don't say anything inspectors say the code is a resource document it's a guideline it's it's prescriptive yes it has to happen but we can use it to make things better for people to help their businesses do better to, we can use it as a as a tool to help make the people who first use the code the contractors better it's a big document it's a great document but people are what the code is all about people make the code people use the code the code again black and white we use it we implement it if you get involved in your membership councils if you get involved in um, any of those any of those groups and I don't want to single them out I'm a BMC I'm building membership council we've got fire safety we've got so many more and I'm not going to name them all right here but get involved encourage yourself to be that professional the one who has a huge impact not just on your community and on the partners, the team you work with, but on the codes nationwide, worldwide, it will be magnificently rewarding to you. I find out more in peer-to-peer -peer networking with people about codes, about my, I find out about my business from when I talk to them. This conversation we're having right here in our questions, we find out how to do what we do and do it better. And so, I'm just going to use it as an opportunity to say we make it happen. Get involved. Become a member of a of a of a membership council. Uh, work on the subcommittees. Become on become a member of the governing committees. We're, we're good at what we do. We need to share that and make ourselves and our partners and our teams and our peers better. I'll hush now. Somebody else take this ball and run with it. Dan, I'll follow you. Uh, I'll give you my experience with uh, with with codes. I started early on in my career as a local fire marshal and uh, building building inspector, and then uh, working my way through. I I kind of got caught up with this group that was looking at codes and and uh, making proposals and stuff. And then eventually, I worked my way up to a 
to a regional committee, one of the old regional committees that uh, a lot of you have served on, I know. And uh, from there, uh, moving on up the chain for me, uh, I had the opportunity to serve and represent the, the National State Fire Marshals on the uh, Fire Service Membership Council. And uh, it was so rewarding to be able to participate and, and it took a little while for me to figure it out uh, about how important it was and, and the changes that we could make and the, the, the whole process of how it works. But it's helped me in my career, it's helped me uh, as a person to understand what, what I do. And now uh, I'm, I'm on my second year now as the chair of the Fire Service Membership Council. And uh, as I'm ending my term out, I'm looking at the people coming behind me, the succession of, of people participating, the people who are, are picking this up and taking it to the next levels. Uh, it's so rewarding to be a part of this. And uh, at the end of this year, as I start to step down, uh, it, it's gonna be a kind of sad time, but it's also a time that I can still continue to participate because on all these councils, there's opportunity for you to come in on our calls. We have calls monthly. There's time for you to come in and participate. In fact, our call is tomorrow and uh, our information's on our website. I'm sure Carl will tell people about that, but we'll, we'll, have, we'll have a few people on there sometimes and sometimes we have a lot of people. But uh, the accomplishments that we've made uh, ever since I've been on the council has been tremendous, both for ICC, for our industry, for our state fire marshals, it's been a pleasure to do that. Thanks, Kim. Go ahead. I'll, I'll also add that uh, you know we need people um, to get involved in a lot of the subcommittees. I know Dan mentioned them. Uh, you know the fire membership council has um, a very active group on emerging trends where we're looking at those things that are out there. And a lot of those topics are coming from the membership. And then we're having people do some, some in-depth research and investigation to find out how does it really affect us um, to try to put together either documents or advisory information for um, the ICC board, um, working through Carl, um, get involved in a work group with the FCAC, um, you know, there are so many different ways for you to get involved in the membership council, the fire code action committee, without actually being on the governing committee or the act, the FCAC, um, where they can't do it alone. We can't do it alone. We need um, your help and your knowledge. Um, and uh, I really encourage anybody that's not tied in with one of those uh, groups, either building or fire, to look for that opportunity, even if you get on one uh, work group, uh, it'll open your world up to a whole different level of professionalism within your field. Yep, and I, I think we've got a, a prime example of that here. So um, this gentleman's asked a question and I'm gonna put him on the spot because I know his microphone works. I, I checked with him earlier. He's not a plant, but I did check with him earlier just to make sure our two-way communication was working. So Tim Deal is with us today and he's a member of the Fire Service Membership Council. Um, he, he also uh, has, has uh, worked pretty closely with the Building Membership Council on one of their subcommittees as well, which is this uh, uh, continuity subcommittee that's out there that helps to kind of tie together representation and share information in between all the councils. So Tim sits on the Emerging Issues and Trends work group under Fire Service Membership Council. And Tim, maybe you can just kind of give a, the folks a quick sample of some of these things that you're seeing through Emerging Issues and Trends, how you translate that into, you know, this cross communication um, through the, um, the building membership council subcommittee and, and kind of tying all that together just to give folks a, a, an understanding of how to participate and then we'll answer your question how about that for a deal no uh, yeah i, I mean th 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 that's fine i appreciate it um yeah the emerging trends uh, i think the, the the most popular one right now that we're really active with is of course what we consider these igloo pods uh where they're using basically plastic structures in some of the northern areas to uh, put them on patios um, for dining areas. So you've got an assembly. Um, you now have these little pods, so they're enclosed with you know eight to ten people. 
that are designed, not they're designed for greenhouses really, um, for plants, not for people. Um, so you have an egress access um, problem right from the get go. A lot of them have zippers. Uh, they're not normal openings. So we have taken that, uh, we've been researching it and, and have really, uh, now it's where do we go with it? Um, so we've taken this, we've discussed it as a group, um, and now we're gonna send it over to the fire CAC, I believe, to say, hey, we believe this is an issue. You know, what do you think about it? Um, so we, we take all those and it ranges from everything from UL to, you know, things that are initiated in the firefighters that affect the firefighter service, but it branches out to that to any building officials. Um, we've got those on board too. And that continuity group is really where we exchange a lot of information uh, to include the major jurisdictions. And, and there's a lot of information that is forthcoming um, from that group. Um, I, and I'm really proud of, of what we put out there that it's a great exchange of information from all the councils and it, it, it's really great. Fantastic. And I, Ed, I know that that one's near and dear to you in terms of that continuity and outreach subcommittee. And that that's really the group that ties all the membership councils together internally and gets that information flowing. But then we've also got this kind of external feel uh, of, of information sharing that comes back out to our partners, like Tim mentioned at UL and, and other industry organizations to share that information out and make sure not only the ICC is addressing it, but the industry is addressing it too. So with that, Tim, what's your question for the panel? And I thought it was, it was really good and it, it's gonna uh, certainly impact everybody in terms of like how we view revenue and the, the code administration world moving forward at the local and state level. And, and really it comes back to that most of the local governments here, especially in Maryland, um, are suffering from severe budget cuts. And I, I know it's across the country, um, but as you, severe, as you have budget cuts, you know, you, you're looking at that's a loss of revenue. How do we make up that loss of revenue? And I know the, the one jurisdiction I was with, they looked at revenue as from fines and, and enforcement. And so my question is, you know, do you see if construction starts to falter or doesn't come back as strong as we think it may, is there going to be a change of policy possibly from less pre-inspection or construction inspection and more of enforcement, uh, especially on the residential side where you have a lot of homeowners now who are home, um, Home, the Lowe's, Home Depot are still open. Hey, I can get my project done. I'm going to do my project and may or may not be code compliant. So I just kind of threw that out there to see thoughts. And do you think there will be that kind of change of policy to more enforcement as a revenue source? I'll throw out that in my opinion, you know, if you're doing enforcement for revenue, doing it for the wrong reason in the eyes of the community. Um, but that's just my personal opinion. I think, you know, you know, there, there should be a fee for um, obviously, you know, coming in and utilizing government services. Uh, but if the government is going out to proactively look for things uh, to generate revenue through the forms of enforcement, uh, it kind of changes why we do what we do. Um, you know, and it could be controversial in your city. It's kind of like the traffic cop going out and writing tickets. The, the fee is a deterrent in order to keep the community safe and uh, keep speeds under control. Um, it's not supposed to be viewed as punitive, even though it is. And does that change how people view fire and building inspectors or code enforcement officers if uh, we're going out to um, ensure community safety and then, uh, you know, charge a fee for doing so. I would, I haven't given that enough thought to find out how that would be viewed um, in the global perspective. I know my community probably would not view that very highly. Yeah, and I, I think Randy nailed it there. Um, you know, I, you got to look back at, at what what's our purpose? And our, our purpose is to keep people safe when they're when they're in the built environment and and you know assessing fines and and fees and 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 things like that. That that's not going to make them safe. Um, that that's not going to make them any safer than than getting getting permits, getting inspections. Um, you know, do doing things the right way. I think we we touched on this a little bit last week, just about you know how much of that 
how much is going to be bounced back. I know there's some communities who, who are, are seeing uh, more growth now than, than they were uh, prior to COVID. So, uh, and then there are some communities out there that, that are lagging. And, and I think we talked about that a little bit last week, but um, you know, possibly something like, like increasing permit fees. I, you know, I could certainly see something like that, but going, going more punitive, I, I, I really hope that people don't, don't start taking that approach out there. Good conversation on that. Good question, Tim, too. I mean, that's a Dan, go ahead quickly. I don't, I don't want to stop with this yet. And I, I really don't. Tim, thank you so much for the question. Um, we shouldn't be adding anything that we're not already doing. And that's the way I look at it. We have a responsibility to our communities. And regardless of what we're getting paid in permit fees, regardless of the revenue we're generating, we need to drop back and say, what is our value to the community? And I'm going to put in a quick plug here for membership councils again. One of the best efforts ever started through a membership council was raise the profile. And it wasn't, you know, it's raise the profile of the building inspector, but it's not to make the building inspector self aggrandized, it's to demonstrate the value of our service in the communities that we serve. That ought to be a big part of what we do. We talk about additional activities that are fund raising activities or revenue generating activities. There are a lot of them that the community needs, that the community doesn't know they need. So look at your community and, and, and see what issues are negatively impacting your community. Use this downtime and the period that's going to follow it, which is going to be a depressed period to figure out what your community needs. And I'll just give you an example. Somebody mentioned, I think Tim did about them going to Home Depot in their downtime and getting that project done they always wanted to get done. Well, the thing of it is they probably did it without a permit, right? So in Winston-Salem and Forsyth County, which is our jurisdiction, we know that there are so many thousands of houses modified, altered, repaired, additions built that never had a permit. But we also know that the realtor community is has has been kind of hamstrung with this new form on the North Carolina bar approved, offered a sale and purchasing contract called disclosure. And the questions are, do you know of work that was done illegally that was supposed to be permitted that was not permitted? Do you know of work that was permitted that has not been approved by your inspection department? Now they can say yes, no, and no representation. But everybody wants a yes if you're buying a house. So we know we've got 10,000 houses that have alterations done inside that were never permitted that should have been by the code and by licensing law. How do you address that? Go talk to your realtors and say, okay, realtors, here's what we want to do. You report to us. We're not going to double fee you. We're not going to penalize you, but you're going to have to get your permits, but then we're going to come out and we're going to inspect. And no, we want to make sure that you meet the code at the time that the house was built or the work was done, but there are things that have changed since then that are life safety issues, and you're going to have to meet those. And we've got different ways we can verify that actually it does meet without you just tearing your hard work from seven years ago apart. But we're going to be partners, and we're going to make this happen. So what we've done, we've reached out to a community to grab a community need that was there all along, but we didn't address it and we're getting revenue off of it, and we're keeping our inspectors busy, making them more sharp, more focused. We're finding new ways, again, to answer the call of a community need. And that's what I encourage all of our body to do during this downtime. Don't think about punitive fines. Think about things the community needs that we're not doing, that we could do, that would make a part of our process going forward, and maybe keep some of these issues from recurring. Excellent. Thank you, Dan, and thank you to the panel today, too. In the interest of time, we're going to have to do some, some wrap up here pretty briefly. We promised you uh, an update on federal funding today. I'll give you a very, very quick overview of that. Uh, we, we wanted to cover um, the, the thought about a stimulus 3.5, as it's been called here in, in DC, um, as additional stimulus legislation. And um, some of you may have seen yesterday the Senate 
passed a uh, $483.4 billion bill um, for additional stimulus legislation. The House is going to take it up tomorrow, so it's still moving its way through and isn't final, but it proposes uh, just over $300 billion in SBA uh, paycheck protection uh, program uh, funding, another $50 billion in disaster loans, and $75 billion in hospitals and health care. So I expect to see that work its way through the house and come to a vote here uh, looking looking like probably by the end of the week and then in in terms of what we were focusing on last week i think you know that the big buckets while we can't get into the really the state and local um, perspective because everybody's different you know the three buckets to keep your eyes open for are really that treasury funding piece um, fema disaster recovery dollars from the disaster uh, recovery fund um, the federal disaster recovery fund as well as the um the CDBG CV or uh, community uh, development block uh, block grant program um, for COVID that's uh, established through housing and urban development. So those are the ones to keep your eyes open for. And what I want to do is direct you to your your state and local representatives from our ICC government relations staff. Uh, we've got a pretty significant push underway right now at the state and local level for AHJs to be able to leverage CARES Act funding, particularly as it comes to virtual code activities. We've had a lot of discussion about that in previous um, uh, webinars, as well as other ones that were hosted separately from this. And I, I provided a link to a, a virtual uh, inspections webinar that was just posted on the ICC Learning Center that took place a couple of weeks ago. So that's a really great uh, resource for you. And, you know, the Coronavirus Response Center on the ICC website will help push you there. But anyway, back to the, the, the federal funding piece, you know, again, the state and local push that we're making for uh, leveraging uh, virtual code activities under CARES and other federal dollars is, is a big piece. We encourage you to reach out to your state and local uh, regional GR managers from ICC Government Relations for help on that. Uh, we're going to be posting more guidance on the ICC website about that here in the next couple of days and in the Coronavirus Response Center. So wanted to just give you that quick update. I mean, I know that's pretty vital and everybody's always um, concerned about the funding. A couple of housekeeping pieces here too. The, uh, the Fire Service Membership Council and the Building Membership Council jointly sponsor the Innovation and Code Administration Award. It's an organizational award and organizations can self-nominate. So if you work in a, a building or a fire department in the country and you feel like you've got a, a pretty strong innovative program that you'd like to share and have be recognized at the national level, applications are available on the ICC website under our awards section. Uh, the deadline for that for this year uh, we, we accept them all year long, but the deadline for consideration for this year is June the 30th. So get those in. Uh, not uh, certainly least um, in our um, in the agenda here for things that are important to the ICC is Building Safety Month, and that is coming up right around the corner, just eight days away. Uh, May the 1st begins uh, our entire month-long celebration and and push uh, towards building safety. Visit uh, buildingsafetymonth.org through the ICC website. It's also linked under our advocacy tab there too. And we're gonna talk a little bit more in depth about that on next week's webinar. Uh, again, the call for committees that I talked about earlier, uh, application deadline, June the 1st, and then uh, some foreshadowing and um, future discussion about our next round table webinar. Session four is really gonna be focused on future planning considerations for reopening the country. And you know that's a pretty broad topic and I think what the, the intent there is to, uh, you know, kind of drill down and start to give a sense of what's happening at the high level, but then more importantly, some of the things that are going to uh, affect you and your departments and organizations on getting back to work. And uh, does that mean, you know, things like phased uh, reopening? Uh, how are we going to do these inspections? Some of that we talked about today. So, you know, that's going to be what we're focused on is if you're not planning now for what the future holds in terms of getting uh, folks back to work, um, is starting to interface with your community and getting your building and fire departments back open for public interaction on a little bit more of a personal scale and those things. You, if you're not doing that now, um, you're going to need to be doing that pretty quickly and we'll have some resources um, for you on that and some good discussion next week. So with that, uh, again, just a reminder that today's session has been recorded. We'll hopefully have this available for you here in the next 
uh, 24 to 48 hours. We had a very quick turnaround last week, which was uh, quite a change from the the 96 hour turnaround that we had at the beginning of this. So I think we're we're starting to level off, and our our IT infrastructure uh, throughout the country is starting to uh, become a little bit more comfortable and able to handle all of this. So look forward to be posted on the Coronavirus Response Center. The link is there, and again, our reminding uh, to you about our next roundtable is Wednesday, April the 29th, two o'clock Eastern, 11 a.m. Pacific. That'll be the last one in our series of four, and we'll, we'll leave you again with that future planning piece and, and trying to create a nice bridge into uh, what, we'll, what we've got planned virtually for Building Safety Month here in 2020. As always, my contact information uh, is located here, as well as my colleague, Bill Nash, who is joining us today and helping us behind the scenes with this. Thank you for your help, Bill. Our contact information is here. And if you need further information from us or would like to uh, find out how you can get involved with ICC and the membership councils and our committees and so forth, please feel free to email. One last reminder that I'll give everyone before we sign off is again, CEUs are available for today. Um, if you've joined us and attended, you will receive an email from me here later this afternoon or tomorrow with instructions on how to be able to access ICC's preferred provider program website and download your certificate uh, to be able to get those CEUs. So more to come on that. With that, I thank our panelists again and for the 200 or so folks that um, stayed with us for the last hour. Thank you for joining us. And we look forward to uh, seeing you, having you participate in the membership councils and hopefully have you back again next week for our final webinar uh, session number four. So with that, good afternoon, uh, late good morning to everybody on the on the West Coast and getting into your afternoon. And thanks for joining us. Take care. Thank you, Carl. Dan, Ed, Carl. Randy. Thank you. Thanks, everybody. See you guys. Guys, one real quick thing. My phone's blowing up here. I've got the city manager and our facilities manager, and I think it's got to do with our additions to the water treatment plant. I know we've got a call scheduled for four o'clock. Uh, 